Alpha Conference, and um, especially privileged to welcome our first speaker, Professor Peter Davies. You know, Peter Davies comes from Melbourne, and uh, he just landed uh, overnight, uh, and he's ready for his first lecture. So that tells about the amount of energy he has got. Uh, he's uh, leading the department at the neonatal medicine in the Royal Women's Hospital uh, at uh, Melbourne, uh, and he's uh, leading the research wing since 2009. He completed his fellowship program in McMaster University, and there he developed the interest in the clinical epidemiology and the evidence-based medicine. Uh, subsequent to that, uh, he developed his interest in non-invasive ventilation leading to the um, MD in the subject and the various publications have been uh, uh, published on uh, that matter and we all uh, follow that very keenly. Uh, he leads a team of enthusiastic and clinical researchers and lots and lots of uh, uh, quality work has been done and published. He is a very substantial contributor to the Cochrane collaboration and is a member of the neonatal subcommittee on the ILCOR. I welcome the Peter Davis. Thanks very much for that very kind introduction. It's wonderful to be back in India. Uh, as you heard, I dro drove in at uh, midnight last night, but it's just such a, a great feeling. It's something unique about India. Uh, you get off the plane and you're in a different world. So for me, this is a very exotic trip. The first thing I would like to do is to say a very big thank you to Manoj for his persistence and resilience and optimism in thinking you can run, a, run a, a, a conference of this size in a time of COVID. So well done, uh, Manoj. You've managed to attract some wonderful speakers and I'm humbled that you've persisted with me. It's, uh, it's really good. And I'm very much looking forward to the rest of this conference and uh, hearing all the wisdom that's going to be uh, brought forth. So today, I'm going to talk uh, about neonatal intubation, the challenges and opportunities. So the first thing to say is that we, we have a problem, we as neonatologists. And the nature of this problem is twofold. If we look at the time it takes us to intubate, here are the, our consultants. On average, consultants take around about 20 seconds to intubate a baby, which is good. It's well under the, uh, the red line here, which you can see represents the 30 seconds that, uh, that is the recommended um, time from international bodies. So consultants do it quite well. We're a little bit better than our neonatal fellows. But many of them and a few of us are taking longer than 30 seconds. The big problem we have is with our junior staff and these are our residents who on average take 50 seconds to intubate a baby. The other problem we has, have is our success rates. So again, our consultants, almost 90% of the time uh, are successful on the first attempt. Our fellows, almost 80%, but our junior staff successful only about one time in four. Why is this so? Well, this is some work from Neil Finer uh, some years ago now, but I think it illustrates the problem very well. What we have is a declining number of opportunities over time. This is the number of opportunities their American trainees had to intubate in a year. It fell from 35 or 45 right down to 12 over a period of less than a decade. And at the same time, the success rates also fell down to, in the American situation, one in three uh, junior medical staff were successful. So less opportunities leading to less success. So what's changed over that era? 
Well, when I was learning to intubate a baby, we were intubating all babies born through meconium, all extremely preterm babies. We got them to the resuscitation trolley and we put the endotracheal tube straight down. We had lots of general anaesthetic sec cesarean sections and the babies were depressed or flat at birth and they really needed some form of definitive respiratory support. So nowadays, we don't intubate all babies with meconium. Nesta Vane and others have shown, shown us, maybe there's still some controversy here, but we, the policies are that we don't routinely intubate babies who are born through meconium. We are now much more enthusiastic about the use of CPAP, and I think we'll be talking a, a more about that throughout this meeting. The work of Colin Morley and the COIN trial and Neil Finer and the support trial told us that nasal CPAP is a very acceptable way of managing these babies in the first minutes of life. And then our obstetric colleagues have got much better. They're delivering much better antenatal care, higher rates of antenatal steroids. Our anaesthetists are using spinal anaesthetics, so our babies are coming out in much better condition. So many fewer opportunities to learn to vent intubate. So this leads to a question, how long do we have to intubate a baby before they become hypoxic? This is a little study we did on 80 babies. These are babies around a kilo on average, around 27, 28 weeks. And on average, we're intubating them when they're failing CPAP at about 36 hours of age. Now, all of these babies were electively intubated, and so they were sedated, muscle relaxed, and they received atropine to stop them becoming bradycardic. Most of them were being intubated because of respiratory failure. Now, the operators, the, the, those who were intubating these babies, predominantly these were our junior staff members. These were our residents, 80% odd. And two thirds of these uh, doctors young, were young doctors with less than a year's experience. Some were intubated by fellows and some by consultants, but the majority intubated by very junior staff who are going to take a long time to intubate and therefore we will get some idea of uh, the saturation pattern of babies during the procedure. So how much time do we have? Well, you can see that to start off with, the saturations are fine. You know, we start off around 95 and for about the first 15 seconds or so, the saturations are quite stable, but then we begin a long, slow, slow decline, not so slow decline, to the point where we're getting down to the saturations of the 70s and 60s uh, after 50 seconds or so. And so to put some numbers on this, on average, we've got about 22 seconds before the saturations drop below 90. 35 seconds before they drop below 80%. 46 seconds before they drop to quite worrying levels, below 70 and then almost a minute to drop below 60. So you can see that these young intubators who are taking on average 50 seconds, we're going to be facing saturations that we're not comfortable with. So we need two things. We need strategies to improve our success rates and also, if that's possible, it would be nice to make our babies more stable, more resilient in that minute or so that it sometimes takes to intubate them. This is a picture of Joyce O'Shea, who is a PhD scholar with us. And she, she arrived at the question with a fairly basic question. The problem these babies or these intubators have is that the person who's training them does not share their view of the larynx. Potential solution to this problem is the video laryngoscope. And so we conducted this little randomized trial to see if trainee intubation success rates were higher if their supervisor shared the view on a video laryngoscope screen. So the comparisons were uh, the intervention group, where the, where the uh, supervisor was able to see the screen and offer assistance, and the control group, where the supervisor offered assistance but without access to the images on the screen. 
So that's the conventional way we would we would teach a, a young person to intubate. The intubators were quite junior. They were trainees during their first six months of tertiary neonatology, and they had, on the whole, very limited previous intubation experience. The supervisors were uh, kept to a, a, a relatively small number, six of them. They were all experienced clinicians, and they were trained to use the equipment and supervise the intubations in a standardised way. And at the end of the trial, it was quite clear that the success rates were better when video laryngoscopy was used. They rose from 41% in the control group to 66% in the video laryngoscopy group. And it didn't seem to matter whether these were babies uh, intubated in the intensive care unit with uh, pre-medication, as I, as I specified, or in the uh, delivery room where there wasn't time to uh, give them drugs before intubation, both groups seemed to benefit, to benefit from the video laryngoscopy. It didn't seem to make any difference to the duration of the, uh, of the successful intubation, still taking that prolonged period of time, around 50 seconds on average to get the tube down. Because most of these babies had had uh, atropine to prevent bradycardia, the heart rate was well maintained in both groups. The saturations were consistent with what I showed you earlier. If it takes 50 seconds to intubate the baby, then those saturations are going to be down in the, uh, in the 60s uh, and below in many cases. So the conclusion at the end of this uh, study was that intubation success rates of inexperienced doctors were significantly higher when the instructor was able to share their view on a video laryngoscope screen. I'll just show you this um, this video of uh, of the of Joyce supervising a young trainee. This is her second intubation. Of course, it takes her some time to start to get a view. Now we see the, the, the uh, vocal cords pop into view now, and Joyce can see that she's got a good view. So she tells her to stop and insert the endotracheal tube. She has a little bit of difficulty, threatens to put it down the esophagus, but Joyce stops her, gives her another try because she's still got that good view. And finally, the, uh, the endotracheal tube goes down. And this is Rani is the re resident's name, and she's just adjusting the, the tube, trying to get it to the right depth, looking at the markings. We put on a CO2 detector, and we see the uh, the colours changing. I want you to keep an eye on Rani's face when it becomes obvious that the tube is in, and she is one very happy resident. I think that's one of the, the best feelings as a, as an old neonatologist if you can supervise a young neonatologist in their first in successful intubation. We then went on to look at the videos and, and to try and work out why sometimes the, uh, the attempts were unsuccessful. And uh, I won't go through all of these, but sometimes the, the, uh, the resident just couldn't identify the cords. But more commonly than that, when we looked at the, uh, at the tape of the attempt, we could see that in the control group where the trainer couldn't see the video, the, uh, the young doctor actually had a good view of the cords at some point during the procedure. They just didn't recognise what they were seeing. So our conclusions here were that the lack of intubation success was most commonly due to failure to recognise midline anatomical structures. Trainees need to be taught to recognise the uvula and the epiglottis 
and use these landmarks to guide intubation. Sometimes they got a view and couldn't pass the tube, and that's to do with the blade design, and, and perhaps the, the designers of laryngoscopes could design a better blade to make it easier to direct the tube through the vocal cords. One thing that we did observe, it was fairly rare that excessive secretions were the problem, so routine suctioning should be discouraged. So that's improving the success rates, but can we give the operator more time to to uh, to put the tube down. Now this led to uh, well us reviewing some literature from the adults and the paediatric publications, uh, and it was to do with apneic oxygenation. And this has been around for some time, particularly uh, in the anaesthetic literature, whereby by providing high oxygen concentrations, often using high flow nasal oxygen they were able to establish some sort of gas exchange uh, in uh, adults being intubated for, um, for operations. So oxygen is able to be transported down the respiratory tract, CO2 back. The mechanisms here, uh, there's some flushing of the dead space with that high flow washing out carbon dioxide and allowing more CO2 to wash out from the alveoli. High flow provides a little bit of positive airway pressure, keeps the airway open, and that's probably helps with gas exchange. And then there's just mass flow of, of oxygen happening and that, uh, that maintains saturations through the intubation attempt. From the paediatric literature, we see this little case report and uh, some fairly nice images of what happens as you increase the flow. And it seems that as the flow is increased from zero to 10 to 20 litres per minute, we get a better view of the larynx. As the, as the larynx is uh, distended, we get a better view of the vocal cords. This led us to conduct the SHINE trial, uh, where we looked at this technique and applied it to newborn babies. And this was led by a, another of our PhD students, Kate Hodgson, published about three weeks ago, so it's, uh, it's hot off the press. So in this trial, we were looking at a population of newborn babies undergoing intubation, both in the delivery room and in the neonatal intensive care unit. The intervention group received nasal high flow therapy during their first intubation attempt, and we were comparing those with our standard care, which is no additional flow. The outcome was a successful first attempt without physiological stability. So I'll just give you some definitions of what we were measuring. So an intubation attempt is the time from when the laryngoscope uh, goes beyond the infant's lip until its removal from the mouth. Successful intubation we defined as completion of the intubation attempt and confirmation of correct placement with a colorimetric expired carbon dioxide detector. And physiological instability we defined as desaturation, so a, a, an absolute decrease in oxygen saturation of at least 20% from baseline, and bradycardia anything less than 100 beats per minute. The procedure is, is quite simple. The, um, the prongs are, are placed in the nose, the tubing brought round behind the baby's back, no um, no tapes are required, just the pressure of the uh, of the tubing keeps the prongs in place. The tube goes down and the uh, and the um, and the high flow apparatus is removed. I'll show you this in in real life. Here we have a baby being mask ventilated. The prongs go in. We've got a, a quite a junior trainee attempting the intubation here, and this is quite embarrassing. It looks quite a rough intubation. We would normally discourage our residents from touching the baby around the eye area, for instance. And you just think that this is not going to uh, 
go well. But in spite of the time that this is taking, and we're up to about 30 seconds already, the saturations have been very well maintained. The heart rate has been well maintained. And we're up to 47 seconds now. Saturation still in the high 90s. Satu uh, the heart rate still very satisfactory. She finally gets a, a view and attempts to put the uh, endotracheal tube in. I think those of you with some experience would suggest that she's probably not going to get the tube in, but for the purposes of this exercise, for all of this period of time, well beyond a minute, the saturations have been maintained in a satisfactory range. So the sample size calculation for this trial, we, we thought that uh, residents would be successful uh, in intubating without physiological intubation, without physiological instability in about 30% of the time. So we needed almost 250 babies to see a, an increase from 30% up to 50%. It's a difficult uh, study to get consent for. We got antenatal and prospective consent wherever we could, but we were allowed uh, by our ethics committee to do retrospective consent if the baby needed a, an endotracheal tube in the first 24 hours of life. And we included um, consent for video recording of all intubations. So this is what the consort diagram looks like. We started off with more than 600 uh, babies screened for eligibility. We had to throw out some babies who were already bradycardic or had some major congenital anomaly. And then there were some that were not randomised because uh, in spite of being a very enthusiastic fellow, she was unable to, uh, to get to all of the delivery. So we were left with 258 intubations and 209 infants. We had a couple of post-randomised uh, randomization exclusions, which left us with a total of 251 intubations in 202 infants. These were the babies that we were uh, looking after, well balanced between the two groups, babies on average around 27 weeks gestation, around 800 to 900 grams birth weight. Again, these babies are being intubated on average in the first 12 hours of life, most of them being intubated in the intensive care unit, but one in four are uh, being intubated directly in the delivery room. Both groups were receiving around 60% oxygen at the time of starting the intubation attempt, and their starting saturations were in the low 90s. And the outcome of the trial was that, uh, as we had hoped, the rate of successful intubation without instability was substantially higher when the babies received nasal high flow. The rate went from just above 30% to 50% gives a highly statistically significant uh, difference. And it means we need to treat six babies with high flow to enable one successful intubation. So a fairly good bang for the buck, if you like. We pre-specified some sub-analyses of the primary outcome. Uh, if we break down the primary outcome into its components, so successful intubation went from 54% to 69%, and the uh, desaturations were much better in the high flow group. Bradycardia was in the same direction, but the rate of bradycardia was quite low in both groups. This was an, an interesting sub-analysis by operator experience, where, whereby we uh, sep separated the group of operators into the inexperienced ones, those who had done less than 20 intubations before, against those who had performed more than 20. And you can see that the, uh, the direction of effect is the same in both, in both groups, but the, uh, the magnitude of the effect is much greater for the inexperienced operators. They went from 16% with standard care to 49% when the babies received high flow. In the more experienced group, it went from 42% to 51%. So it seemed to be that the inexperienced operators were the ones that benefited most. And interestingly, 
with high flow, it gave them success rates that were very similar to those of the exp more experienced colleagues. Other sub-analyses showed that the high flow was consistently effective across gestational age. It didn't seem to matter whether the babies were uh, big or small, mature or immature, and whether or not they received pre-medication. Secondary outcomes, uh, putting the prongs on, as you saw in the, in the clip, is quite easy and quick. It takes nine seconds on average to get the high flow on. The median saturations were higher. The time to desaturation was longer in the high flow group. No difference in the duration of attempts and no evidence of any harm coming from the high flow. No uh, increased risk of needing uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation or adrenaline. No increase in pneumothorax and no difference in mortality rates. So in conclusion, uh, we found that nasal high flow during neonatal endotracheal intubation improves successful intubation at the first attempt. Fewer babies desaturate during the procedure. And we thought that this intervention has the potential to improve care. What should we do with this information? Well, getting it into practice, there's pros and cons. The pros are, it's easy. The technique is, is simple. It's not, it's not difficult to put the high flow prongs on. Against the use of high flow is the cost of the prongs. And it, perhaps it might be distracting. It's something else to worry about during a stressful procedure. The unknowns, and this might be of, of relevance uh, to this audience, we don't know what component of the high flow it is that it, it delivers the benefit. Is it just the oxygen? Could we just give um, ordinary subnasal oxygen, non-humidified, non doesn't necessarily have to be high flow? Or is it the pressure that, uh, that comes with delivery of high flow that is effective? Or is it a combination of the two? We used eight litres per minute uh, in our babies. Should we use more, pre more flow or less flow? And as I said, would low flow uh, subnasal oxygen be just as good? And a, a final question is 100% oxygen safe for this relatively short duration. So research, clinical practices is a team game and uh, I think we have this in common between Australia and India. We, uh, we play in teams, and uh, this is my team, and so I'll finish by acknowledging their contribution. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Professor Davis. Uh, what a way to start. Uh, we always work with ABC. It's from Australia for A is for airways A. So that's how we started this conference. Uh, this is a topic which is very uh, close to my uh, practice as well. Uh, uh, we started using video that is scope way back in 2012, 2013, um, uh, when uh, in UK it was a very early intake. Uh, and uh, even though we did not do it as a part of the trial process, uh, we found that uh, the, it was most useful for the junior trainees because you could stand there and teach them which bit is which and whether to draw the blade a little bit further or push the blade in to see what there. And if they if it didn't have a view of the cords, we were not passing on tube to them. Compared to conventional, when they say, yes, yes, I can see, please give me the tube, you give a tube, baby, people start bagging and baby doesn't improve. So that has led to a huge uh, uh, practice, especially the nurse practitioner's training. In uh, UK, the nurse practitioner's training has been... Uh, big uh, move uh, recently over the last decade, and nurses have improved uh, in, in their getting their intubation skills. But one thing which you uh, missed out in this, uh, maybe deliberately, was that uh, in the consultant group, what you showed in the beginning, in your that consultant groups were the highest success, but their confidence interval was the highest. Did you look into the age group of the consultants by any chance? And, and because I'm, I'm going to say there's a relevance on that, that's a very, very provocative question, isn't it? Um, 
The first thing to say is that video laryngoscopy is, is really good for the older consultant whose eyes might be uh, not quite what they were in their 20s and 30s. So uh, it's um, it's useful for the, for those uh, consultants as well. Yeah, the there were there were uh, broad confidence intervals for the consultants. My speculation, and I don't I don't know this, is that by the time the consultant is asked to pass the tube, this is a difficult baby, and that might explain why as you rightly point out, that some of those babies intubated by consultants were taking uh, quite a long period of time, although, although on average they were intubating earlier than the fellows and the, certainly the registrars. Um, there were times when the consultant did, did struggle. Uh, thank you. That was our similar uh, uh, observation. Um, uh, Sidra, we, uh, I, I work in Sidra Hospital, uh, for some of you who knows me. Uh, Sidra Hospital started in about four years ago, and the consultants came from all over the world. Uh, and the mean age group was above 50 for most of them. Yeah, 50, 55 and above. Uh, some of them were younger, but most of them were above. Uh, they actually purchased about uh, eight video laryngoscopes, but they were lying in the uh, cupboard and not, not being used. And when I joined and I put video laryngoscope into practice, we still had a difficulties in implementing it because people said the technique is quite different because you are not looking at the baby. It's a hand-eye coordination. You're looking at the screen and you are intubating. And I found it very, very challenging to change. So we had to change that the first intubation attempt is going to be whichever way you are comfortable. And if that fails, the second intubation attempt, it is going to be by the video laryngoscopy. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, again, I think there's probably going to be a generational change. I think uh, those who follow us are going to be more used to looking at things on screens than uh, in reality, and and uh, and it will be a more natural thing to uh, drive the uh, endotracheal tube while looking at the screen. In fact, during this this study, the uh, as you saw in the in the video I showed, the residents were using the the uh, the laryngoscope in the traditional way. They were looking directly at the uh, at the vocal cords. But uh, one of the advantages is that um, it, it, the view on the screen, once you get used to it, is actually quite a good uh, quite a good view, particularly for those of us with with failing vision. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's 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 here to stay. We also had difficulties. Uh, we, we had purchased this video laryngoscope maybe uh, 15 years ago and it was gathering dust in the corner until we decided to, to do the randomised trial. Once again, showing that sometimes doing a trial is the best way to uh, introduce a, uh, a new technique into practice and, and that's, that's what happened. There has been some uh, improvements in the design of video uh, laryngoscopes uh, with subsequent iterations, and, and these days they're much easier to set up to start. They're much more robust in, in terms of not fogging up, not not uh, giving obstructed views, and and so I think in in future it's only going to get easier to um, to uh, to use the video lar laryngoscope. Sometimes the question comes up, well, if you if you train people to intubate using a video laryngoscope, what happens when they no longer have it? They go to another hospital that doesn't have it. Um, the argument there is that really what we're using the video laryngoscope to do is to teach our, our young doctors to uh, identify the landmarks to develop the, the technique, to be able to see the uvula, to see the epiglottis, those midline structures that will tell you that you're in the right place and then, uh, as as we showed showed in that uh, supplementary study, once you've got that the knowledge, it's the, it's that combination of the knowledge of what you're seeing and then the ability to execute that that will make them more successful. Uh, the video then just comes in various makes, uh, um, and uh, at least a couple of makes which I am uh, aware of are the CMAC and the Acutronics. Uh, they all have a different sizes of the blades and where the situation of the bulb is from the tip of the blade. Uh, any recommendation as to, uh, 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 from your experience, that uh, based on the size of the blades or the success rate is any better with one over the other? Because from 
uh, uh, I have a particular uh, view because there are some laryngeal scopes that are smaller plate for smaller babies. These are they are more appropriate. Whereas for bigger babies, it doesn't really matter. I, I think that's going to vary from unit to unit and the the spectrum of of patients that you are looking after. For us, the Accutronics has been uh, has been a, a, a useful uh, one, but I, I think it's a matter of uh, of having a look at each of the the um, devices that are available to you and and seeing which is most appropriate for your particular patient mix. If you've got a more mature uh, patient mix, then you might uh, prefer a different um, video laryngoscope. Uh, just to open the floor to the uh, uh, delegates as to um, how many of you are using the video laryngoscope in your day-to-day -day practice, uh, if just to put a hands up, just to have a fair idea about how many units are using it. So, Professor Girish Gupta's unit is using it regularly. Your experience, sir? You want to make some comments or any questions on that? So, is, is you found it helpful to tier, train your nurses on that? Okay. Uh, any questions? Uh, if are there, we can get some questions from the audience. If that's okay with you. Are there any mics? Thank you. Uh, that was a wonderful presentation, and I love the little little uh, studies that you have done, looking at such simple things which we take for granted. But my comments were to question and comment. One was uh, I was also concerned about the oxygenation with the high flow nasal cannula that would be worrisome. But my comment, I will move away from the video laryngoscope. And I love the present, uh, the slide that you had where the residents are having less and less exposure to intubations. And I think for those of us who are training, it's a big concern, especially when you have a super speciality training going on. So it's the fellows who get the opportunities and the residents don't get that the postgraduates. And I think as teachers, we need to look at this seriously and make sure that we give them enough opportunities. That, that those are my comments. Sorry, do, do you want me to repeat it? Using for the residents uh, from your slide and so how do we uh, give more opportunities for the residents? So that's something good. And the second is to think about the yeah. So sorry, I, I didn't quite understand your question. How do we give the residents more opportunities? I think that's that's almost impossible, isn't it? Because our consumers, our patients, our parents are demanding the highest level of care and are quite um, reluctant to let the junior doctors practice. So I don't think this problem is is going to go away. So we've got all of these issues that I mentioned: the the greater use of CPAP. The, not, the lack of routine intubations, I don't think we're going to find a way of um, giving our trainees more experience on human babies. Sometimes the, uh, the use of mannequins is, is helpful, but as I, I guess you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a long way from um, reality. But it does teach them how to hold a laryngoscope uh, and to have a rough idea of what the cords look like. But I agree, this is an almost insoluble problem. So I think we've just got to make uh, allow them to make the most of their opportunities. And I think these two things will help them to do that. You know, if we are using the video laryngoscope to teach them the anatomy, that's a good thing. And if we can give them a little bit more time so that they can be successful, that's also a good thing. Now, I think your question uh, about the oxygen concentration in the high flow, we started with whatever concentration they were receiving prior to intubation. But if the saturations dropped below 90%, then we increased the FiO2 to 100%. Uh, just to make a brief comment on the same, at our place, uh, just to improve the exposure uh, to the intubation, what we have done is that uh, we run a regular simulation workshops, which teaches two things. One thing is about the teamwork around the intubation, because teamwork around the intubation is also equally important how they communicate. And second is we have three mannequins of different sizes, 
And that's the as realistic mannequins currently available, like a 25 weeker, 650 to 700 gram baby looks very realistic, whether you handle it, the uh, size of the uh, oral cavity and the uh, vocal cords looks very similar. So we train uh, our uh, uh, trainees on that and we found that to be uh, very helpful. And uh, one of my colleague in the UK who is now in Abu Dhabi, Dr. Alok Sharma, he has produced some mannequins where he has made it as an anterior airway by strapping the thing and not being able to open the jaw. And again there, the, because the field of vision uh, with the video lensoscope is much higher, the success rate has, has been a uh, lot better. Obviously it can't replace human babies with secretions and baby moving about and those things. But those are the things we have done, Madam, in our unit to give a more exposure about the airway, teaching anatomy in an elective way when they are not stressed. Uh, and uh, that's, that's the best we could do. Yeah. Excuse me, sir. Sorry to interrupt. We have five more minutes to end this session. Yeah, we are 14.56. So we, we will give a final word from Professor Davis and then we'll end this session. Yeah. You have something to say? They are running out of time. Uh, I, I was just going to say that one of the interesting things that I didn't mention in the video laryngoscope study was the relatively high rate of success in the control group. It was 40%. And I think some of that came from the expertise of the trainer. So if trainers are, are teaching intubation the same way each time and you've got very experienced trainers, then that gives the operator the best chance with or without a, a video laryngoscope. So uh, it sort of supports you, your, your point that um, practicing in the simulation environment uh, probably helps to get our um, routine going so that we're doing the same thing each time. That's all. Thank you. Uh, for lack of time, we will uh, end this session here, but more questions, Professor Davis will be available over the break. But can we give a big round of applause for Professor Davis to start off the session in a big way? Thank you.